Hey guys, um, I'm in Tayebi and I'm currently working for Exelon, utility company, as a data science manager. So a little bit about myself. So I have been around AI for almost 10 years. Can you guys hear me well or? Oh, soon enough. Did you get that soon enough? Yep. Okay. I'm just gonna turn it Yep. So basically I met AI 10 years ago and that's where I fall in love with that. And my background is in environmental engineering. And it's basically, you know, deal with GIS, remote sensing, you know, capturing data from satellite images, how we can extract future from it. So, yeah, during my PhD, you know, that's where I started to implement AI. And the, big, the project that I was working on is about predicting urbanization for entire country, for entire US. So we were dealing with over, I would say, 40 terabyte of data at that moment. It's just all satellite imagery. And we are trying to build a model that basically understand how urbanization happened across time, you know, using historical data, and how this urbanization can be linked to climate change and water quality. So after that, I joined as a big data engineer to Climate Corporation. And, you know, my role was about, like, developing API and host them on the cloud. And after that, I changed my role to the data science again, which my life basically turned to fun again. And I was the, you know, working for a ag company where we are predicting demand forecasting, you know, supply chain, like working uh, with customer data, you know, how this transaction happened. We, we are also working with you know, in terms of the seeds that we were recommending to customer based on like the field that they have in the country, soil condition, weather situation, where are the best seeds you know, they should buy that have basically maximized the yield. And after that, I joined Esri as a machine, senior machine learning engineer where it was again, you know, AI and fun stuff that I'm gonna talk about one of them today. But this is how my life looked like right now in utility space, which I'm kind of new and I just joined Exelon a few months ago. So in utility, you know, we are working currently on different use cases that I'm just going to try to go over a few of them. A storm readiness that, you know, when the storm comes, we want to figure out how the storm is going to hit the city. And of course, people are going to lose power. You know, there are some stuff that we need to do beforehand and understand how this prediction should happen. Where are those areas going to get affected? And it's mostly based on weather data. And that's the challenging part, right? Weather data, you just turn on the TV, watch the news, and they said, tomorrow it's going to snow. But you're not going to get any snow, right? This is typical weather data that we are using to deal with. But again, how this is going to help us to understand, you know, that's another question. The other part that we are working on is asset health, that, you know, we basically generate power all the way from substation, go through distribution, and eventually come to our customers that could be either residential or commercial that they use power. And during this journey, you know, each of the assets that we basically have all on the way, you know, they are having basically life cycle. In order to understand this asset, that how they perform, you know, against the voltage, you know, or other stuff they're going through, that how long they are gonna last, and when is the best time that basically we can replace them before it affects our customer, you know, it's very important for us. It goes basically to power outage, you know, other stuff that our customers are experiencing. So with that being said, this is typical that you are hearing in AI, right? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So the area that I'm currently active is computer vision in 2D space. You probably have heard of it, right? Extracting object from imagery. You know, it could be anything, right? Car, which is my use case that I'm going to talk today, is one. Then, second area that I'm basically going to spend some time on is segmentation, where you are having satellite imagery or anything else that you are defined, you are trying to define classes for every single pixel in the image. This is not detecting object anymore, right? You are going to say, for example, here is the forest, here is the road, here is the house, here is the swimming pool, you know, something like that. The other area, anybody knows what this data is? Any guess? Yeah, LiDAR, point cloud. 
So I did a bunch of object detection from 3D point cloud. You know, you're basically dealing with massive data set that is even hard to visualize. So, you know, it's like, you know, you have heard about it in autonomous driving, right? They put on the top of the car beside the camera that they get RGB image beside point cloud to detect of like basically anything, right? That you can see. So it can get even crazier. Then you can go to 3D segmentation where again, similar to 2D, you know, you are dealing with 3D. But the problem with 3D, you know, is kind of completely different space because you are only dealing with coordinate from X, Y, Z and intensity that you are getting from LiDAR or any other point cloud. You know, you have to come up with the object. So you are basically, this is how, you know, human brain basically work, right? You see the object, you reconstruct it in your brain and says, here, for example, is human or here's a chair, or you know, other object that you can think of. And the last area that you know, I started to investigate during last year is basically reinforcement learning that you guys, you know, we had another conversation, I guess another talk before this, right, earlier. That's another fascinating area right now, which is still growing fast, and this is, I guess, I borrow this from OpenAI website. So if you want to learn more about my recent work, you know, I just try to be active, write blogs, publish it at Medium or other places that I can, and to share and you know, hear from other people. But today I'm gonna to talk about the initiative that we had with the smart cities last year. And this is one of my favorite projects I had because you know, it's dealing with pretty much, you know, you can see like the workflow of AI ML, you know, from all the way beginning to MN. So we had a customer, which was Department of Transportation in DC. They said, we have close to 200 cameras in DC. We are watching, you know, what everybody does, like how are the cars, people, everything that passed. And right now we have five to 10 people that are just basically sitting there and watching this camera to see what's going on, which this doesn't seem really efficient, right? This is like a tedious task, and who really wants to do that, right? This is where AI comes in, and we decide you know, to do automate this process. So in this project, you're gonna hear about GIS and remote sensing, where it's just you know, dealing with data collection, that how we are actually, as why even location data matter, right? Why we need to know the coordinates, or even datum, or you know, other stuff. It deals with remote sensing where we are, you know, getting those live feed cameras from, you know, different intersections in the city. It deals with the cloud where we build our model and deploy it. It deals with deep learning, you know, that's one piece that we are just building the model using the data that we are getting. It deals with big data, we, you know, in, it's like both sides this side because we are digesting so many images per second, plus we are also writing the results, you know, to the dashboard or other stuff that I'm showing. It has IoT piece that it goes basically to Apache Kafka, that we are using it to write the results. And it also has dashboard that normally business people go crazy about dashboard, right? They don't want to know anything about deep learning. They don't care what it is. They don't even get one to involve with it. So they, what they don't want just say, I want a dashboard to see if Show me what's everything happening there. I don't want to get in details, but. And it has partial statistics. So we are using a statistic to basically detect some of the anomalies or other you know, pedestrian behavior that we notice. So this is how the end flow of, I guess, end-to-end -end life cycle of deep learning with imagery at least look like to me. So we are starting with images, right? For our case, we are leveraging APIs to digest those live feed camera. We do some preparation on those images, right? Prepare the data and basically you know, get different data set that we need for training that I'm gonna go later on. We do data labeling, come up or define bonding box around those classes that are our interest and we are trying to predict them. We build a model on the cloud, right? Typical machine learning, I would say, project. Then we deploy it on the cloud and, and cons, you know, consume the model, and we call it basically inference. And 
So here, you know, we also have like a feedback loop. This is where we revisit our model to see where models succeed and where models fail and try to see you know, if there are those locations the model fail and we can feed back basically new data to retrain the model. And the last piece is, of course, you know, business people again take action on how they want to really use this data. So, so everything that you guys saw here, I'm gonna walk you through you know, step by step. So image acquisition, right? So we need to get data, right? For us, it was not hard to get this you know, data because we had access to Traffic Land API. That's where they are covering in, I would say, DC. And so before you know, capturing data, we had to think about lots of things, right? First of all, we have daytime and nighttime, right? That we need to detect objects. So we need to take images both from daytime and nighttime. Second, each of those cameras are pointing to the different direction, right, in the intersection. They can zoom in, zoom out. They can rotate around. So basically, the situation changes every second based on how these cameras are moving around. So getting like the right data that you can create basically on bias model that can perform or at least does his best at the situation is pretty tricky, right? So we had to consider all of these situation, you know, from angle, from scale, zooming, you know. Is this camera is blur right now, the image that we are reading, you know? Is there any obstruction right now? Is it like block, you know, our view or anything like that? So we captured close to, I would say, 500 images. And you guys can see why later, why 500? I mean, 500 or 550, right? It doesn't make that much difference. But something around that for our case was enough. So then we start to label our images. So here we just use open source you know, software that's called label image. We basically went through every single image, defined the bonding box, and put the class name. And save them as a you know, XML file or text file in Cocoa format or anything you know, that you can actually fit into your model. So then having the data, which the input was our images, and the output was basically the bonding box, right? We did transfer learning on top of yellow. You know, yellow is you only look once. This has been developed like a few years ago, and it has, you know, version one, version two, and version three, which is the most, I would say, the complicated one that it has, you know, if you see, it has like ResNet and structure, you know, it does inception and other stuff on top of yellow. But the key idea is this model was already trained, and what we did, we did transfer learning on top. Transfer learning, it basically means somebody trained the model, which has, you know, this, I think this has like close to 32 million parameters. This model, you know, trained with like classes that you don't need to retrain, you know, this model from scratch. What you do, you just bring your data, which I did, you know, with 500 images. Then I basically load the initial model that was already trained and did transfer learning. And this model, you know, start to do tuning and other stuff based on the data that I'm fitting in to basically work for the classes that I'm looking for. So then we got to the inference. Inference means, you know, you have your model, model is trained, you put it in production, then it just run real time and, you know, detect those classes that you are looking for. For us, you know, it was cars, it was buses, it was truck, it was bike, and it was people, basically. And we deployed it both on Azure and Amazon. I guess it's just we had like different customer that some of them were working with Azure, some of them were working, you know, with Amazon. So, so what we were doing, you know, we are extracting this. This is getting the fun part, right? This basically means not only we are, you know, generating data every day, AI can generate data for you as well, right? Every image that we do in France, we detect those basically by like bonding box that we would call, those are the new data that we are generating, right? Those are the one that we are trying to look at and see you know, how we can use them for. So here is the dashboard if I can click on that. Not sure this is running or, oh yeah. So this is one of the local run that I did before I push it to the cloud. So here are, 
you know, it just run every image, you know, basically, and run the inference, get those bonding box, and print it out. And, you know, we define, like, different workers. At the same time, we are loading images, you know, from different, like, intersection. We are, at the same time, we are running the inference. It's kind of, you can think like a parallel processing. Then we embedded with Esri on Portal. These are the things that we are writing. So we are writing camera name, camera ID, location that has the coordinate, as well as you know, the time, the number of the cars, the number of people. And we also store the image at the same time that if somebody wants to go back and see what's happened at that time. And so, so you are generating all of this data, right? The whole point is what we are going to do with this, right? For our case, we were interested in traffic and how traffic change, basically, you know, second to second or minute to minute in DC. So, as I said, you know, we are generating data, right? We are running the model every second, and we basically writing two different type of info to Kafka. And, you know, Kafka is just, you have, you know, I guess in a nutshell, you have producer, which our producer was our deep learning model that is like running the inference, getting the info right there. Then you have consumer. Our consumer were basically our dashboard that we are showing to business that you guys are going to see later. It shows the traffic flow, you know, how this like traffic change, you know, in different intersection every second. And we are writing this info as well. So this is basically, that one is tr like traffic info that says the number of the car, number of the people, you know, number of the buses and everything for each intersection plus images that you guys saw already. Then here, we are writing the bonding box. The bonding box, you know, we are writing like X mean, you know, X max or everything for every single bonding box that we have. So if you think, you know, this is, this can get crazy very easy, right? You are basically writing bonding box and in, in each image, you know, you can have 20 objects, right? Or 25. I just did, you know, simple math. You know, we are basically ingesting close to 10 million records per day. And this is not even that much, right? You're just talking about 120 or 200 cameras. Then we had another customer that they had close to 4,000 cameras. So you see, you know, the scale, when you scale this, the numbers are just, you know, exponential. And it's just, you are getting like, okay, how are we are gonna run this at a scale with so many things that you have? So the last part, I guess we are using the numbers to just visualize on the dashboard with basic statistic to say, yeah, here is the number of the car, here are the number of people, you know, at different intersections. And we provide map that people can zoom in to different location, and this dashboard is get updated every second for you. We use also this info, the lower part, which showing the bonding box of you know, different images to basically track anomaly. See, you know, what are those anomalies? Let's say for a specific time of the day, you know, let's say 4 p.m. on Monday, we have this number of the car. If, you know, we go above that with certain threshold, you know, using a statistic, you know, simple as that, say, okay, this location at this time doesn't look, you know, normal. So we are gonna flag it for them and they can go and see what's happening. This can be two different things, right? Let's say accident happened, Right? We can have like, so many cars that it's more than that is expected. It could be because of event that you, know, you see so many people that are walking around intersection, or you know, it can be anything else. So here is a dashboard that we put together. And so this dashboard is basically reading the info that we are generating on Kafka, right? We are writing to Kafka and this dashboard grabbing those data from Kafka and read them and put them on the basically you know on the dashboard for people that they want to go and look at it. So as I said, you know, this is DC and you know it's just color coded based on the intensity of or density of the traffic that we have. Those are that are more intense, it means we have more object. If they are less, you know, it means there is less traffic there. And this dashboard you know, is basically based on the zoom. If you change the zoom level, you know, it can get updated based on the number of the cameras that are falling in your zoom level. And you can click on any point that you want and see the numbers specifically for each intersection, you know, for number of the cars or anything like that. 
and you can, you know, move around the dashboard. Basically, you know, you can get anything you want. And the other thing that we did was anomaly detection. So since we have the number of the cards, and you know, we know what is the expected, you can say expected value, I would say, for you know, a specific intersection at a specific time, if they, you know, those red areas or red dots are showing abnormal behavior. And you, know, you can we just use like some simple statistic to aggregate our data at the minute level, you know, because working at the second, you are just like having so many things, you know, right? And some abnormal things can come up that are not really abnormal. So we aggregate it at some level, then we use that, and when the new data comes in, we compare it with that lookup table that we have on the cloud. You know, if it's more than that number, specifically, we just flag them out and say, yeah, here is the anomaly that you can see what's happening there. And lastly, I guess, is another one that we are trying to flag, like, I would say, unsafe intersection. When I say unsafe, you know, people, instead of taking crosswalk, they are just do jaywalking, they just do other things, you know, crossing the street. So this is, this is what's important for business. They were asking, like, just tell me where are those intersections that you feel are pedestrian, you know, in D.C. are more exposed to accident. And tell me where they are so I can go and do something about it. You know, build a bridge or, you know, find any other way. So each of these points that you guys see, you know, I just run the model for five, I guess, five hours or six hours. And if you remember, I was storing the bonding box, right, of each object that I have. This is showing how people basically walk around the intersection across time. So you're dealing with the space and time, right? I'm not sure how some of this happened, but if it happened, you know, I don't know what the person was doing in the middle of intersection, but, but anyway, so we are using some density clustering approach, and you know, we use DBS scan that basically to identify those unsafe behavior, or I'd call them anomaly again. And this is just working based on the density, how these points are close to each other. You know, of course, these are that are close to each other seems perfectly fine. Or other points that are more separated or, you know, from other points, they can be identified as an anomaly. And I guess here is just one of the person, you know, we detected for, for them. But yeah, with that being said, done. And if you guys have any question. Yep. Uh, things that happen might, or things that might happen very infrequently, like a major snowstorm or something like that. Yes, we did. Any experience with, uh, you know, how how these uh, models were performed in those conditions? Yeah, in those situations, it doesn't work that well. So you see, the lens is completely wet, and it, like even human doesn't see anything. So it's just if human cannot see anything, so the model cannot do anything. Except if somebody go clean the lens, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I guess for this case it was fine because yellow is already trained on those classes that we were looking for. So, you know, if you go to the data set that yellow is trained on, person, you know, like cars or other things already part of it. So for because of that, you know, we didn't need to get like large data set. And it worked pretty, I mean, I guess the accuracy that we got, it was over 95%, which was pretty impressive with like, you know, few hundred images. But yeah, if you, it's just depend on the case, right? If you have a trained model that is completely trained on something else, let's say you have a model to train on dogs and cats, right? 500, of course, is not going to be enough. You need much more than that. Yep? How did you define accuracy in your data set model? Well, we use some of our basically label data. So you went through and labeled this is a car, a human, and then you ran it through to check the accuracy. That was the 500 images? 
Yeah, we had 500 for training. We had another like 100 for basically testing. But apart from that, we had like a feedback loop that people were going and see based on the detection, which are those places are missing and which one is not. That's like a loop, loop back that we had as well. So it was just always like keeping up with those images that we ever never used in training and never seen them in validation basically. Any more question? Cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.